I'm Liam. I'm Wayne. You're listening to In Film We Trust YouTube. A place where we post clips from our recent episode. All links down below in the description. And now, on with the show. So when I was researching this film, I came across a website called flickeringmyth.com right. and the review for this film started off, I think very appropriately, it said, Japanese cinema has often been a front runner for the weird and wonderful. I can't think of a better way of putting it than that. Weird and wonderful, Wayne. It, <laughs> it perfectly encapsulates this film. This is what, I think this has to be the most experimental film we've done so far. On Definitely. Film we One of the most experimental films I've ever seen. Yes. It, not, not just ones we've covered, ones I've ever seen. Obviously directed by Tsukamoto, mm -hmm. 1989. Yes. Based on a play he wrote in college. That would have been interesting because he wrote and starred in this because he writes and stars in this too. So did they ever make the play? Or was it just written? No, I think he actually did perform the play. They did when perform he was, it. I think it did actually That would be an yeah. experience. How do you think that translates over to a... A live medium. Well, I don't know because the film relies a lot of the time on various editing and film yep. techniques, the kind of things you couldn't do on stage. So I don't know, like, what would it have looked like, you think? This is a, a perfect encapsulation of film and techniques, as mm -hmm. you just said. Yeah. So, for example, a big portion of this film or a big highlight of this film is the stop motion. Yes. How would you translate those kind of techniques to a live theatre experience? You can't really, unless no. you just moved in a different way. But stop motion is a thing, again, reserved for things like movies and TV. You can't really do it in a live format like a play. There is, obviously, there's experimental plays, mm -hmm. but this almost feels inherent to film this film. It does. Film. To, yes. To say. Well, when you think of experimental plays, that's experiment, experimenting with where to move your actors. Or the out, form. Or the form. Or yes. like, for example, i seen a play once where the whole thing was these two big kind of circular sets. And every time the scene changed, the sets rotated and you're in the next scene. That's kind of experimental here. Again, it's all editing, film techniques, and like you say, the stop motion animation. But we, as we should say, this film, actually, there was a gestation period because, of course... It was written as a play, but Tsukamoto also done The Phantom of Regular Size two years prior. <laughs> a short film, a short film filmed on Super 8 film, yeah. which is essentially, you would say, a prototype to... Yeah, he did two short films, both of which were filmed on Super 8. Right. And I think making those, I don't know how much money he made from them, but it gave him the confidence to move on to do this. This was 16 millimeter, 16 millimeter, which I think perfectly captures the degradation of the the landscape of the film the aesthetic the aesthetic is yeah. a very kind of dirty gritty rundown look to it yeah because 16 millimeter a lot of independent films use 16 millimeters it's almost like a hallmark of of independent cinema i think they should bring back 16 millimeter i love the aesthetic of 16 millimeter mm -hmm. it always feels good when they bring it back because you're what it's because it's all digital film now but when you look back at these uh, these 16 millimeters or 32 millimeters yeah there's a a uniqueness to it that you just can't capture in digital recording. This film also ties in somewhat to, we obviously covered a film called Upgrade. Mm -hmm. Upgrade is under the cyberpunk genre. This also is under the cyberpunk genre, though Tsukamoto had never heard of the term cyberpunk while he was making this. No, well, was cyberpunk not coined in the 80s? I and, think, I remember yes. then, yeah, because this movie was 89. 89, so, but it was filmed over 18 months. 18 months, it was over 18 months, and it was a very difficult shoot from what I read. A lot of the crew members actually mm. left. They did, because it was filmed filmed in uh, Kei Fujiwara, who plays the, yep. the female lead. It was pretty much entirely filmed in her apartment, and a lot of crew members lived on the set. Can you sum this up? You, you may know. I'm, I'm not sure the answer. Was the girlfriend in this film Tsukamoto's actual girlfriend at the time? Do you know or not? Don't think she was. I didn't come across anything that Because I've that. read two conflicting things, that it was her apartment, as you just stated, and but yet it was also Tsukamoto's apartment. So I'm kind of wondering, hmm, I wonder if there were a couple at the time. Hmm. No, I didn't I didn't come across anything that said that, just that it was uh, that it was her apartment. Something else I found that is that about the only crew member that actually stuck with the production yep. only did so because he wasn't actually living on set, because it would have mm -hmm. been that... They would have gone stir crazy trying to make this film and living on the set at the same time. Do you think living on set was necessary? I don't think so. Was it just budgetary? It reasons? must have been. You just couldn't be bothered shipping them from place to place. So ah, just, just look. Just stay here. We will. Yeah. We'll find a way. Yeah. Also, here's a question I was thinking of a while ago, quite a while ago. We did Censor, yep. which was about the video nasty thing. It's a terrific film. Exactly. Very good film. Do you think if this movie had been made in like the UK or America, it would have been classified as a video nasty? Because I read an article that suggested it might have been. Hmm. Does it seem like a video nasty? Is it a video? 
that's that's an interesting thing. But here's the thing: is it too artful to be a video nasty? It could be. It's a film that you have to say when you watch it. It's for a lot of people. It's very difficult to know what to make of it because that flickeringmyth.com yep. article I told you about. The guy who wrote it, he sat down with two friends to watch it. At the end of the film, one of them said, "What the actual fuck is this?" The other one said, "Is this the greatest film ever made?" Do you have an opinion yet, Wayne? Well, oh we'll, no, we'll, we'll get no, to it as we go along. No. I wouldn't go. I wouldn't go to maybe either right. of those extremes. But Ooh. yes, it's it's you have to admit it is a difficult movie to know what to make of it. A film always compared to David Lynch and David Cronenberg, mm -hmm. which isn't accidental because Sukumo mm -hmm. himself had said they are the father of my style. Yeah. He was steeped in their films. Mm -hmm. It's com very complimentary to be compared to either of those guys. I Definitely. even wrote down it was very David Lynch esque, especially as Eraser Head. Razor, a razor yep. head, yeah. Even like the look of it, the stop motion animation, the kind of dark and gritty feel, everything felt like it was... When was a Razorhead? Was that the end of the... Seven? Early early 80s, I think. Early 80s, yes. Before he did like... Which um, was a terrific film. Do you like a Razorhead? Yeah, a Razorhead, a Razorhead was really good, yes. And that's kind of playing on the same. Like th this film itself, it's it's almost like a nightmare or dreamscape, mm. isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's like... I wrote down, it's like a nightmare that you can't wake up from, a nightmare that you're stuck in. Which is, a, a moment ago you mentioned the video nasties, but I think this actually would be hard to classify as a video nasty for the sole purpose that a lot of the themes and the degeneracy, if you want to call it, is hidden in imagery, what well, doesn't make it explicitly obvious. Yeah, well, there's not so much dialogue. So much of this movie is... Imagery. Watching the characters interact, it's the animation. Yeah, it's the imagery, but that's what tells the story. The BFI, the British Film, Film Institute, Institute, called it, and I quote, metallic mayhem and graphic depravity. There's another good way of putting it. I think it. That's, that, that, that definitely sums it up, Wayne. It that does, definitely yeah. sums it up. Do you know if it did success, if it was, did well at the box office? I don't think so. I, I, oh, I wish I'd read it down. I forgot where. It was very going underground. It was very unnoticed, but they played it at a film festival, mm -hmm. and that's where it gained a cult following. I think it was actually more successful in Europe than it was in its native Japan. Oh, was it? Because I was trying to find any information I could about how much money it made, and this one thing came up and it said it made $585 million. I'm like, shit! I'm like, oh, that's Iron Man. That's, how, uh, yeah. <laughs> that's, yeah. what, that's, that's what Iron Man... Bit of a Man, different film. Quite a different film, There yes. was an anecdote where uh, the director, Sukamoto, he was asked, w w where, where's the name uh, Tetsuo come from? Because I think there's two interpretations of in Tetsuo, the, the name itself. There's a translation where it means iron man mm -hmm. so literally the the name of this film is iron man the iron man <laughs> right. but there's also in can you remember there's a cyberpunk animated film um akira akira there's yeah. a character in there called tetsuo there is canada and tetsuo yeah they yep. were the lead characters and sukamoto was asked this he said oh well i thought of changing the name because mm. it would maybe imply too much that he's come at, you know influenced by akira and he said that's sold it. <laughs> oh, or do you think adding the subtitle kind of would clarify? Because if you just heard of a movie called Tetsuo, maybe a lot of audiences outside of Japan wouldn't have been interested. Because the name Tetsuo can also mean in Japanese gift or philosopher. Oh. Those kind of interpretation. And I think there's an interpretation where it just means Iron Man. Yeah. Okay, yeah. well, honestly, it's a film with, I have to say, like you say, interpretation. That's a perfect word to talk about this film because there are so many different themes going. Like you say, it's proof like a razor head that even a film that seems very simple on the surface, there's many layers to it and there's many different ways you can um, appraise it. Definitely many layers. The first time I watched it, for the first 20 or so minutes, I thought, my God, this is brilliant. <laughs> then it got to a point where I was like, hmm, this is actually getting to the point where is it using a form too much or a technique too much where it's just becoming a mindfuck? You thought it was maybe overkill. But no, second time I watched it, I thought, all right, I get this now. Hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm appreciating it for more than just a stylistic approach. I'm actually getting its themes, mm -hmm. getting its intention. It's funny because when you mentioned that, I talked about David Lynch earlier, the first time I seen Mulholland Drive, I felt yep. the same way. I was really frustrated with it first time, but when I watch it back... Uh, subsequent viewings, I'm like, yeah, this is really good. This is really well done. I think some of the best cinema does that. Lost Highway was the same. I'm still not sure what David Lynch's <laughs> Lost Highway is completely about. Maybe David Lynch doesn't know either. 
No, I, I think <laughs> when you have a vision so much, mm -hmm. you have an interpretation already. Mm -hmm. They're not going to admit to that. Lynch is very cavalier here, <laughs> and he won't admit to anything. He says it's what you want it to be. So you think he's done that to inspire more conversation? Yes. Because he, doesn't want, he doesn't want people to keep asking him what I it means. I think we discussed this with Under the Silver Lake, and there's an endurance in the unknown because mm. it keeps the audience coming back for more and it keeps them guessing. Yeah. Rather than just summon it up. It's like, there's filmmakers, and I'm not being specific here because I can't think at the moment, but there's <laughs> filmmakers who will make something completely convoluted and completely weird, but in the last 20 minutes, they'll wrap it up mm -hmm. and they'll tell the audience. Mm. But there's films that endure where it's so much of a mindfuck, and even the last act is never explained. Yeah. So it's everything's up for the audience to interpret themselves. The kind of thing, the kind of films where like think pieces are written, people discuss it extensively. You bring your friends over and say, watch this, not do you enjoy it? What do you think it means? 